death of party. So what is the effect of the death of a party? Whenever a party to a pending action dies and the claim is not thereby extinguished, it shall be the duty of his counsel to inform the court within 30 days after such death of the fact thereof and to give the name and address of his legal representative or representatives. Failure of counsel to comply with this duty shall be a ground for disciplinary action. The heirs of the deceased may be allowed to be substituted for the deceased without requiring the appointment of an executor or administrator and the court may appoint a guardian ad litem for the minor heirs. The court sh shall forthwith order said legal representative or representatives to appear and be substituted within a period of 30 days from notice. Okay, so if no legal representative is named by the counsel for the deceased party, or if the one so named shall fail to appear within the specified period, the court may order the opposing party within a specified time to procure the appointment of an executor or administrator for the estate of the deceased and the latter shall immediately appear for and on behalf of the deceased. The court charges in procuring such appointment if defrayed by the opposing party may be recovered as costs. One example of a claim that is not extinguished by the death of the party is an action for the recovery of money arising from contract. When the action is for recovery of money arising from contract, expressed or implied, and the defendant dies before the entry of final judgment in the court in which the action was pending at the time of such death, it shall not be dismissed but shall instead be allowed to continue until the entry of final judgment. A favorable judgment obtained by the plaintiff therein shall be enforced in the manner especially provided in the rules for prosecuting claims against the estate of a deceased person. Substitution is allowed only in actions that survive the death of a party. Question. Should there be a formal substitution of heirs in case of death of the party litigant? Torres v. Rodelias, GR number 177836, September 4, 2009. The Supreme Court held in this case that Rule 3 Section 16 provides that a deceased party may be substituted by his heirs, but it must be emphasized that substitution may only be allowed in actions that survive the death of a party thereto. In Gonzalez v. Philippine Amusement and Gaming Corporation, citing Bonilla v. Barcena, the Supreme Court declared that the determination of whether an action survives the death of a party depends on the nature of the action and the damage sued for. In the causes of action which survive, the wrong complained of affects primarily and principally property and property rights, the injuries to the person being merely incidental. While in the causes of action which do not survive, the injury complained of is to the person, the property and rights of property affected being incidental. Okay, In the case at par, both parties accuse the other of unlawfully depriving them of their respective rights to acquire the subject property together with the house built thereon. Evidently, what are primarily and principally affected herein are the property and property rights of the parties and any injuries to their persons, that is, damages, are only incidental. Such property and property rights survive the death and may pass on by succession to the heirs of the deceased. Therefore, the heirs must be allowed to continue any litigation to protect said property and property rights and to substitute themselves for the deceased party in accordance with appropriate rules. The court held that according to Section 16, Rule 3 of the Rules of Court, a counsel within 30 days from his client's death is duty-bound to inform the court of such fact and to submit the names and addresses of the deceased client's legal representatives. Thereafter, 
the court shall order forthwith the appearance of and substitution by the deceased party's legal representatives within another period of thirty days from notice the court held that nowhere is it mentioned in the instant case when the party died with no exact date of the death the court had no basis for determining whether the attorney or attorney restorer was able to inform the office of the president of such fact within the requisite period of 30 days nevertheless even assuming that attorney restore belatedly notified the office of the president of the death section 16 rule 3 of the rules of Cor court only provided that in case of failure of the counsel to comply with his duty as stated in the first paragraph of the rule it would be a ground for disciplinary action against said counsel not that he or she would already be without personality to appear as counsel in the proceedings for the benefit of his or her client or the latter's heirs instructive is the ruling of the supreme court in the case of heirs of nugid vida de haberer versus court of appeals florentina was the appellant in the case still pending before the court of appeals when she died florentina's counsel attorneys bausa ampil and suarez gave the court of appeals notice of their client's death and requested the suspension of the running of the period within which to file the appellant's brief pending the appointment by the probate court of an executor of the latter's estate the court of appeals denied the motion for extension or suspension of time to file appellant's brief and dismissed the appeal florentina's counsels filed their urgent motion for reconsideration explaining that their predicament over the requests for extension or suspension of period to file a brief was due to the uncertainty of whether their services would still be retained by the heirs or legal representatives of their deceased client florentina's counsels still felt obligated however to preserve the right of florentina's successors or heirs to continue the appeal pursuant to section 16 rule 3 of the rules of court pending the settlement of the question of who among such heirs or successors should be the executor of the deceased estate hence florentina's counsel presented for admission the printed brief for the appellant the printing of which they had deferred for professional ethical considerations pending action by the appellate court on their request for suspension of the period despite the explanation by florentina's counsel the court of appeals still refused to reconsider its earlier dismissal of the appeal and to admit the submitted appellant's brief in addition to invoking the general principle that litigants have no right to assume that such extensions will be granted as a matter of course the appellate court also cited the equally established principle that the relation of attorney and client is terminated by the death of the client however upon appeal to the supreme court it held that a court of appeals gravely erred in not following the rule by requiring the appearance of the legal representative of the deceased and instead dismissing the appeal of the latter who had yet to be substituted in the pending appeal the court of appeals therefore erred in ruling that since upon the demise of the party appellant the attorney client relationship between her and her counsels was automatically severed and terminated whatever pleadings filed by said counsel with it after the death of said appellant are mere scraps of paper the court held that if at all due to said death and severance of attorney client relationship further proceedings and specifically the running of the original 45 day period for filing the appellant's brief should be legally deemed as having been automatically suspended until the proper substitution of the deceased appellant by her executor or administrator or her heirs shall have been effected within the time set by respondent court pursuant to the cited rule the court held that the court of appeals could have deferred any action on said motion until a substitution had been effected and it had ascertained that the substituted heirs chose to retain attorney restore services as legal counsel conspicuously 
the office of the president completely failed to act on the information that Edwino had died so as to effect proper substitution by the latter's heirs as set forth in section 16, rule 3 of the rules of court. The only action the office of the president took as regards said information was to deny the motion for reconsideration filed by attorney restore for his lack of personality given his client's death. This, according to the Supreme Court, is totally contrary to equity and fair play since Edwino's heirs were, in effect, deprived of their right to seek re reconsideration or appeal of the adverse decision of the office of the president, which was itself partly responsible for their non-substitution. So what is the rationale of the substitution of heirs? The purpose behind Section 16, Rule 3 of the Rules of Court is the protection of the right to do due process of every party to a litigation who may be affected by the intervening death. The deceased litigant is himself or herself protected as he or she continues to be properly represented in the suit through the duly appointed legal representative of his estate. The spirit behind the general rule requiring a formal substitution of heirs is not really because substitution of heirs is a jurisdictional requirement, but because non-compliance therewith results in the undeniable violation of the right to due process of those who, though not duly notified of the proceedings, are substantially affected by the de decision rendered therein. It must also be remembered that unless properly relieved, the counsel is responsible for the conduct of the case. He is obligated by his client and the court to do what the interest of his client requires until the end of litigation or his representation is terminated formally and there is a termination of record. And the only way the office of the president could have ascertained whether a attorney restore still had the authority to file the motion for reconsideration on behalf of Edwino's heirs or otherwise had been relieved or his representation terminated was by having Edwina's heirs come forth as the rules required. In fact, in the letter of appointment which was presented before the Court of Appeals, Alfonso and Fatima, as Edwina's legal representatives and heirs, explicitly retained the services of attorney restore by appointing him and engaging his legal services in the case before the office of the president and to further represent them in the event that the case is appealed to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. Even though belatedly executed, such letter of appointment demonstrates that if they were just given the opportunity by the office of the president, Alfonso and Fatima could have easily confirmed the authority of attorney restore to continue acting as their counsel in the proceedings and to submit the motion for reconsideration. Interestingly, if as argued by the office of the president and the court of appeals, Attorney Restore no longer had the personality to represent Edwino upon the latter's death. Assuming he died prior to the rendition of the decision of the office of the president, should it not also follow that the sending of a copy of the decision of the office of the president to Attorney Restore as counsel of record could no longer be deemed a notice to the party and his receipt of the same could not have caused the commencement of the period within which to file a motion for reconsideration? As a consequence, the reglementary period within which to move for reconsideration of the decision had really not yet begun to toll. Given the foregoing, the decision of the office of the president could not have attained finality, it being partly responsible for the non-substitution of the heirs for the deceased Edwino, the office of the president could not dismiss the motion for reconsideration filed by attorney restore to the prejudice of said heirs. Justice and equity demand that Edwino's heirs be given the opportunity to contest the adverse judgment that affects the property and property rights to which they succeeded. A rule intended to protect due process cannot be invoked to defeat the same. So when is the rule applicable? Uy v. Del Castillo, 2017. The Supreme Court held that Rule 3, Section 16 or the Death of Litigant, and Section 20, Action on Contractual Money Claims, 
apply in cases where the defendant dies while the case is pending and not before the case was even filed in court. Question, should there be a formal substitution of heirs in case of death of the party litigant? Heirs of Hinog versus Melikor, GR number 140954, April 12, 2005. The Supreme Court held that no formal substitution of the parties was effected within 30 days from date of death of Bertuldo as required by Section 16, Rule 3. Needless to stress, the purpose behind the rule on substitution is the protection of the right of every party to due process. It is to ensure that the deceased party would continue to be properly represented in the suit through the duly appointed legal representative of his estate. Noncompliance with the rule on substitution would render the proceedings and judgment of the trial court infirm because the court acquires no jurisdiction over the persons of the legal representatives or of the heirs on whom the trial and the judgment would be binding. Thus, proper substitution of heirs must be effected for the trial court to acquire jurisdiction over their persons and to obviate any future claim by any heir that he was not apprised of the litigation against Bertuldo or that he did not authorize the lawyer or the attorney to represent him. The list of names and addresses of the heirs was submitted 16 months after the death of the Bertuldo and only when the trial court directed attorney Petal Corin to comply with the provisions of Section 16, Rule 3 of the Rules of Court. Strictly speaking, therefore, before said compliance, attorney Petal Corin had no standing in the court when he filed his pleadings. Okay, take note, in this case, the court held that non-compliance with the rule on substitution would render the proceedings and judgment of the trial court infirm because the court acquires no jurisdiction over the persons of the legal representatives or of the heirs on whom the trial and the judgment would be binding. Take note that the Supreme Court used the word infirm, not void, so non-compliance of the substitution makes the judgment or proceedings infirm because this might lead to any future claim of any heir that was not apprised of the litigation against the deceased. But it does not make the judgment or any action on the case void. Karandang versus Heirs of the Guzman GR number 160347, November 29, 2006. The issue in this case is whether a decision rendered after the death of a party is void for failing to comply with Section 16, Rule 3 of the Rules of Court. In this case, the spouse's Karandang claims that the decision of the RTC, having been rendered after the death of Quirino de Guzman, is void for failing to comply with the Section 16, Rule 3 of the Rules of Court. The spouse's Karandang posit that such failure to comply with the above rule renders void the decision of the RTC in adherence to the pronouncements in Viuda de Haberer v. Court of Appeals and Ferreria v. Viuda de Gonzalez, where the court held that it has been held that when a party dies in an action that survives and no order is issued by the court for the appearance of the legal representative or of the heirs of the deceased in substitution of the deceased, and as a matter of fact no substitution has ever been effected, the trial held by the court without such legal representatives or heirs and the judgment rendered after such trial are null and void because the court acquired no jurisdiction over the persons of the legal representatives or of the heirs upon whom the trial and judgment will be binding. In the present case, or in, the, in that case cited by the spouses Karandang, the court held that there had been no court order for the legal representative of the deceased to appear, nor had any such legal representative appeared in court to be substituted for the deceased. Neither had the complainant ever produced the appointment of such legal representative of the deceased, including appellant, ever asked to be substituted for the deceased. As a result, no valid substitution was effected. Consequently, the court never acquired jurisdiction over appellant for the purpose of making her a party to the case and making the decision binding upon her, either personally or as a, or as a representative, of the estate of her deceased mother.
So do you agree with this or is this correct or not? Failure to substitute or failure to comply with, a rule, with rule 3 section 16, does it render the judgment void or any proceeding in the case void? The Supreme Court held that unlike jurisdiction over the subject matter which is conferred by law and is not subject to the discretion of the parties, Jurisdiction over the person of the parties to the case may be waived either expressly or impliedly. Implied waiver comes in the form of either voluntary appearance or a failure to object. In the cases cited by the spouses Karandang, the Supreme Court held that there had been no valid substitution by the heirs of the deceased party and therefore the judgment cannot be made binding upon them. In the case at bar, not only do the heirs of the Guzman interpose no objection to the jurisdiction of the court over their persons, they are actually claiming and embracing such jurisdiction. In doing so, their waiver is not even merely implied by their participation in the appeal of the decision, but expressed by their explicit espousal of such view in both the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. The heirs of the Guzman had no objection to being bound by the decision of the RTC. Thus, lack of jurisdiction over the person being subject to waiver is a personal defense which can only be asserted by the party who can thereby waive it by silence. Now, the question is, if the non-substitution or the non-compliance with the substitution does not render the proceedings in the action void, what is the effect of non-compliance with substitution? It also pays to look in the spirit behind the general rule requiring a formal substitution of heirs. The underlying principle, therefore, is not really because substitution of heirs is a jurisdictional requirement, but because non-compliance therewith results in the undeniable violation of the right to due process of those who, though not duly notified of the proceedings, are substantially affected by the decision rendered therein. Such violation of due process can only be asserted by the persons whose rights are claimed to have been violated, namely, the heirs to whom the adverse judgment is sought to be enforced. So in sum, the RTC decision is valid despite the failure to comply with the Section 16, Rule 3 of the Rules of Court because of the express waiver of the heirs to the jurisdiction of their persons, and because there had been before the promulgation of the RTC, RTC decision, no further proceedings requiring the appearance of the Guzman's counsel. What are the claims that are not extinguished by the litigant's death? These are recovery of real and personal property against the estate, enforcement of liens on such properties, and recovery for an injury to person or property by reason of tort or delict committed by the deceased. The rule on substitution provides that if the action is not extinguished by the death, it may continue. So let's say an action for the recovery of property was pending and the defendant dies. It may still continue. If a subsequent special proceeding is initiated before the pre previous judgment is executed, it may then be considered as a claim against the estate in the special proceeding, evidenced by the favorable judgment. How about if the party dies before any action is even filed in court? Is there a remedy? Like for example, there is a creditor who wants to file a claim against a person who already died. Can he do something? Yes, there is. The proper remedy is to file a claim against the estate in a special proceeding, not in an ordinary civil action, say for example, for the recovery of property or for the Enforcement of a loan obligation. No, it can't be done in an ordinary civil action if the other party already died. There must be a claim against the estate in a special proceeding. But take note that it doesn't mean that when the party dies, there is no remedy against him. If let's say that he has a creditor, then the creditor can pursue a claim against the estate in a special proceeding.